At this point, we're going to turn over to a brief overview of our project. Um, as Peter said, it's been a project long in the making. We've officially been funded over the past uh, six years, but I think, as Peter said, we started sort of laying, laying the groundwork for this project um, quite some time ago, probably 10 years before that. So the vulnerable populations that we are focused on as a first step are Indigenous, immigrant and refugee, rural, remote and northern, and children killed in the context of domestic violence. And of course, with any project like this, and particularly a national project, um, it's not two individuals, but it's a team of very crucial individuals who um, have got us to this point. So along with Peter and myself, we have um, some wonderful um, co-investigators, Diane Crocker, Nova Scotia, Miriam Dubay in Quebec, Mary Hampton in Saskatchewan, Nicole Latourne in Alberta, Kate Rossiter in British Columbia, Jane Ursel in Manitoba, Sapali Garage and Katrina Scott in Ontario, Catherine Holtman, New Brunswick, Kathy Richardson, Quebec, Julie Kay, Saskatchewan, Curtis Moffat, Northwest Territories, Jordan Fairbairn, Ontario, and Kendra Nixon in Manitoba. So over the past six years, these individuals have provided extensive knowledge and expertise to this project. While we are co-directors, we really operated as a management team who could not have accomplished what we have without the support of our invincible project manager, Annalise Stratman. She's been keeping us on the straight and narrow right up until probably five seconds before we launched today. So we could have not got to this point without her. We also work with two unmatched research managers, Marcy Campbell, who was with us from 2015 to 2018, and Julie Poon, who started with us in 2018 and continues with us today. We also were fortunate to have Jordan Fairbairn, who was a postdoctoral fellow during some very crucial years of the project. So it's been very much a team effort and what a team we had. And Peter will continue to describe those um, team members. As Myrna said, this uh, research grant really is a major partnership. Um, Myrna listed some of the co-investigators. And again, um, this research involved 13 universities from coast to coast to coast. So for those of you who do research, and even for those of you who don't, you know, think about trying to get ethics approval uh, from multiple universities. So even, for example, the the research you're going to hear about uh, shortly from Myrna and Jordan Fairburn and Danielle Sutton, even thinking about gathering information about domestic homicides across the country, took negotiations with individual coroners and medical examiners. We had to keep uh, secure files, uh, encrypted files and locked rooms. So working with multiple universities is also following multiple universities protocols on ethics. So I just want to emphasize that um, it's it was a very complex uh, process. And also uh, doing interviews with survivors, trying to protect that information is critical. So uh, it was it was an onerous process where we had to re reassure every research ethics board uh, that we were doing our best to uh, protect individuals. And just to give you a, a sense of that, um, since we we have time to, to mention this, even when we were interviewing key informants, we interviewed uh, 370 professionals from coast to coast to coast, uh, police officers, uh, uh, shelter workers, uh, people working in child protection. And we even had to have protocols in place to deal with ways we may traumatize those professionals by asking them questions. So I, I mentioned that just as an example of the kind of uh, care we experienced and the, the rigorous questions we got from multiple uh, research ethics boards. We also had uh, 50 collaborators, so we had multiple organizations and individuals we worked with. Uh, for example, we uh, were pursuing issues around risk assessment as a major topic, and we went to some of the leaders in the field who were doing research on risk assessment, risk assessment uh, tools. Uh, we also, in working with diverse communities, wanted to make sure we had good representation from Indigenous communities, Indigenous leaders. 
And we also worked with immigrant refugee populations and wanted to make sure we had representation and collaborators with, within uh, those areas. We had 35 different partner organizations that we worked with actively uh, from the outset. And, uh, and even in applying for the grant, uh, Myrna and I worked very actively with Claudette Dumont-Smith, who you'll hear from later today, uh, who was executive director of the Natives Women Association of Canada. Uh, and we put a lot of care into our applications and trying to make sure that, uh, that the research we're doing was going to be not only thoughtful, but also productive to answer key questions. We also had 50 research assistants uh, from across the country. And when I mentioned research assistants, many of them were graduate students. And I should indicate that when you apply for a SHRC grant, uh, one of the key things that we are told is that the grant not only should answer key questions, but we're looking at developing the next generation of researchers and practitioners. So we have uh, research uh, assistants who are graduate students who are working in the area of criminology, sociology, psychology, uh, social work. Um, we had people representing uh, diverse disciplines, which were really critical. We also had actually a research assistant who's now in law school and his background was really helpful. So uh, I mentioned that only because that's one of the outcomes uh, from a SHRC grant is you're providing information, you're providing knowledge across the country, but you're also developing the next generation. So when I retire, which is shortly, and when Myrna eventually retires 20 years from now, uh, then we know there's another generation that we can pass the torch on to. Next slide. So of course we had all these individuals and, and access to their expertise and knowledge and we managed to leverage that into a number of core project activities over the course of the past six years. So the first thing that we um, undertook was a comprehensive literature review on risk assessment, risk management and safety planning around domestic homicide generally, but specifically for the four key populations as well. And after narrowing down an initial list of references from over 2000, 2000 references um, generated based on, on relevance to the topic, we ended up with about 590 documents to be included in our review and re review report. And it's actually available on our website. So if anybody's looking for some information, it has to be updated clearly um, because this was one of the first stages of the project, but it's available on our website. The second core activity was the homicide database, and we're going, going to be going into this in some detail in a moment, so I'll not say anything further on this now, but we'll come back to that. The second um, core phase was a key informant survey on risk assessment, risk management, and safety planning. And this was conducted with over 1,400 respondents from coast to coast to coast. Um, so this asked um, individuals 12 core questions around risk assessment and safety planning. Following that, we had key informant interviews, and as Peter mentioned, we had over 340 conducted. And this survey and the interview findings will be the focus of our, um, our time together tomorrow. So please join us again tomorrow to get more information on that. In phase three, which we really just wrapped up in the last few months, it will be the focus of Thursday, uh, our activities together on Thursday. And it was based on 127 interviews conducted with survivors of high-risk violence or those who are family or friends of domestic homicide victims. And again, you're going to hear those voices throughout the next three or four days um, to remind us of why we're doing this, this work. And so far, these data have been used in 10 theses and dissertations. As Peter said, this is one of the core outcomes of a project like this is to make sure that we're generating new researchers who are focused on domestic homicide. And he'll discuss um, some other outputs that we have accomplished as well. A key aspect of uh, any research grant and, and certainly any SHRC grant is making sure the information you gather uh, gets around the country and informs policymakers and practitioners in the field. So every research grant, uh, especially these days, really wants to know about knowledge mobilization. In the old days when Myrna and I were kids and just starting out as academics, you know, it was exciting to get a paper published or get a book published. And that was sort of a sign of success in academia. 
it no longer works that way. Um, books and publications are almost secondary, and now what funders want to know is the information getting out to the field in a timely way. And we were involved in multiple activities uh, to achieve that. We had a major conference in London in 2017. Those were the pre-COVID days when you could fly all over the country and meet in person and have small group discussions before we all went online with Zoom or now Hopin. Uh, so we had that conference uh, that's recorded and actually it's on our website. And uh, what's interesting is that I know many uh, professors and many practitioners uh, like Myrna and myself still go back to that conference and go to some of those videos and PowerPoints uh, to share information uh, with students and also uh, public service uh, organizations and, and also many community agencies. Uh, we had three partnership meetings, as you know from the earlier uh, slide, that we had so many partners and collaborators across the country uh, we had national meetings with our partners uh, talking about all the important issues. Even something that would seem uh, as simple as what is a domestic homicide, an issue that Myrna and Jordan and Danielle will be talking about uh, later on. Uh, even that basic issue is so, is so critical. And remember, even one of our first meetings, we probably had a two-hour discussion and even defining what a domestic homicide uh, involves, you know, who's included, who's not included. We also had meetings with uh, uh, graduate students, research assistants for support to each other. And I think, Myrna, we can say successfully, we've developed a network of uh, young scholars across the country. Um, some of the young scholars that I know I was working with are now in, in practice and they have remained connected uh, through various conferences. And uh, I think that's certainly been been critical uh, we have a number of uh, homicide briefs if you go to our website the cdhpi website uh, you can download uh, homicide briefs that deal with various topics if you're looking at particular research on children living with domestic violence or children in domestic homicide or look at research by the death review committees across the country you can download a brief on that topic there's a number of bulletins uh, and updates that we provided throughout the course of this uh, last six years. We've produced a number of infographics. We find obviously people are busy in terms of digesting reports. You know, we used to think about publications and then we wrote briefs and then some people are too busy to even read the briefs. And we have many people say, can you just give me the information in a, in a snapshot? And actually recently, um, I mentioned this to Myrna, recently even in the Ontario Domestic Violence Death Review Committee, uh, we had a meeting and external consultants that said, we need to have the annual report in a snapshot. There should be one infographic to make sure everybody gets an overview of what's actually happening within the jurisdiction. So that, that's also been a, an important development. Uh, there's been uh, a number of uh, reports produced about our work and posted. Um, there's been seven journal articles and a number uh, that are just awaiting final review. So certainly the word, word is getting out um, across the, the country. And more than 50 presentations, conference presentations, webinars. We've, I know we've been to Canadian conferences. I know in Halifax, actually from coast to coast to coast. And I know there's been conferences. Uh, there was a major international conference on domestic violence in Oslo uh, pre-pandemic where a number of our students uh, were able to present. And so any, I think the critical thing was we've gotten the information out. So, uh, and we're very proud. And again, this is a, a lot of things that I'm highlighting on this slide. The nice thing is you can go to CDHPI and you can see all of them. Um, uh, readily if you look through the resources that are available.